Table of Contents An Introduction, Why I Wrote This Book Secret 1, There Is No Fixed Sequence for Manifesting Secret 2, It Starts With An Intention Secret 3, The Intention Must Be Clear Secret 4, Getting Rid of Automatic Counter Intentions Secret 5, the faster you let it go, the faster it comes. Secret 6, what is real, anyway? Secret 7, stop trying to figure things out. Secret 8, how to speed things up. Secret 9, silence the reasoning, rational mind. Secret 10, manifestation cards. Secret 11, the sacred role of action. Summary of Manifestation Principles An Introduction, Why I Wrote This Book We all have the innate ability to manifest and create our own ability. To manifest is to bring something from the spiritual realm of the non-physical, to the physical plane. It means bringing into existence something we can see, feel, and touch with our five senses. Of course, that also means something which we can enjoy and savor with all our physical senses. There is a common misconception that when something is on the spiritual or non-physical plane, it is not real. If you want to become a conscious, deliberate manifester, then it will help if you remove this limiting belief from your belief system. What is vividly imagined or envisioned in the spiritual slash non-physical plane is just as real as something which is in the physical plane. Until you realize this great universal truth that the ancient spiritual masters throughout the ages have been telling us and really have faith in it, you cannot become a true and powerful manifester. For you'll be constantly making distinctions between what is manifest in your life, and what is not yet manifest in your life. A master manifester, in my definition, is someone who is fully aware of his creative and manifestation skills. I use the word aware because the powers of creation and manifestation are something which we all have, but few of us consciously use. Most in today's society use it to create and perpetuate more lack. Most use it unconsciously to create situations which they do not want, and then use those very same manifestative powers to then get themselves out of those situations. So in essence, life becomes a series of games. It starts with us using our power to create something which we do not want, and then using our power, out of sheer desperation, to get us out of that situation and wondering what landed us in that unwanted situation in the first place. Until you see yourself as a conscious creator, as an attractor of everything that comes into your physical experience, you'll always feel yourself to be powerless. You'll always ascribe and prescribe circumstances, situations and events in your life to external causes. But there are no external causes. Everything happens in and from you, this has been the teaching of the spiritual masters throughout the ages, regardless of which book you pick and read. But it is so difficult for most people to get because it requires that one takes total responsibility for everything that happens in their lives. When people become lost or confused, or when they feel that external circumstances, events, things or powers are dictating the flow of their lives, they tend to become superstitious. They tend to believe in external causes such as almanacs, horoscopes, numerologies and other divination tools. But how can you believe in those mystical divination tools and at the same time believe in the power within yourself? They are completely divergent in nature and those two opposing nature of beliefs cannot possibly coexist together. I have often been asked whether one should believe in something like numerology, or feng shui, or horoscopes and almanacs. The truth is that none of these matter when you are trying to create your own reality. The spiritual masters have told us, time and time again, that the power is within us. It is not in something that is outside of us. Even positive psychology says this, that when we ascribe power to something that is outside of us, 
such as what an ancient book says, or what an ancient calendar says, then in essence we are giving our power away. We are admitting that we are powerless, and that something outside of ourselves, such as the placement of my table, has power over the results in my life. For some people, such a thought can be liberating because it frees them of the burden of being responsible. It frees them from the need to be accountable. Now they can blame something outside of themselves instead of something within themselves, such as a faulty belief. They can say, oh, my table or bed was not positioned correctly, therefore I had poor results in the past. Now this very same individual may experience miraculous results with feng shui or any other kind of superstition, because in so making that change he or she has suddenly given himself permission to succeed. He or she has released all resistance and in that moment, allowed the success he was seeking to come to him. Quantum physics talks about the field of potentialities and possibilities. This field is completely unpredictable. It has to be completely unpredictable and completely open in order to truly contain any possibility. If the field is predictable, it would then tend towards a certain fatalistic outcome and our potentials or possibilities would therefore be limited. However, we now know that the quantum field is unlimited, and literally put, anything is possible. Since anything is indeed possible, the moment we ascribe a cause to something, it is so. The moment we say something is the reason for something, it is so because we proclaim it to be so. Therefore, people who are superstitious and often looking for external causes frequently say things like, oh, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed today, therefore, now recognize that when you say or even think something, you are not saying those words to a field of nothingness. You are saying those words out loud to the field of quantum possibilities that literally, surrounds you. It is just that our five senses cannot accurately perceive this field yet. So when you ascribe a cause to something, and make up your own reason for something it literally, becomes so. The belief becomes reality in your world and literally perpetuates itself. Back to the question of whether lucky charms and superstitions work, they do. They work exactly because of the principles we have touched upon earlier. They work because you proclaim them to work, thereby collapsing the quantum field of possibilities, where anything can happen, into a particular outcome or certainty. From that particular outcome or certainty, you then attract and gravitate towards a smaller subset of outcomes or certainties until things line up exactly the way as you imagined or intended them to be. Enough for you to look at all the evidence and say, see, I told you so. So therefore if you have a strong, underlying belief that wearing black is unlucky and you believe in it strongly, it would be unwise for you to go against it for in your current belief system, you have collapsed all the possibilities, including one of black being lucky, into a certain predestined outcome. And your reality, events and circumstances from that point onwards will match that. This is the role of lucky charms in your life. If some spiritual master tells you that buying a $5,000 statue or reciting a particular mantra is good for you and you trust him dearly, then you had better do it because that is the way your current belief system is set up. So is that spiritual master right? Of course he is. But is he telling you the whole truth, that you can be free from him and free from such crutches? Maybe not. You can be free from all the crutches and tools that bind you. You should only use them when appropriate, as learning aids along your journey. I use them as learning aids along my journey, often switching from one tool or meditation to another, often with great results. But I am not stubborn. I do not cling on to these tools. I know it is not the tools that are bring about the results but my understanding and application of the universal principles that these tools are helping me do.
at the end of the day, it is not even my understanding or application that matters. It is up to the universe, more commonly known as God's grace. Everything happens by grace, indeed. We can affirm or set intentions and wish for something so hard, but if it is not aligned with our highest good, it will not appear in our lives. This is not being Pollyanna-ish, but recognizing an important and real spiritual truth. How many times have you said, thank God that thing I asked for at age 16 did not come true? Of course, it does not only happen at age 16. But I am constantly amazed by how a higher power always knows better than I am, and I am at a stage today where I can look at the unmanifest things in my life and give thanks for them. Today I understand that everything is in my life for a reason, and some things may come into my life at a later time, or not at all. Whatever it may be, I am at peace with it all. And being at peace is the one of the best feeling places one can possibly be at. It is my intention in writing this book, to help you be at peace with wherever you are in life. For it is only when you are truly at peace, not feigned peace for the purpose of some manifestation, where ironically, things start to magically fall into place and happen for you. It took me years and years of practice to finally realize that you can physically do all the steps and rituals, but you cannot fool the universe, yourself, one bit. The universe sees through all your thoughts and feelings. So if you're going to do a ritual, then do it with the purest and most aligned of intentions. If you have the purest and most aligned of intentions to begin with, then no ritual is necessary. No outside action is necessary. There is truly nothing you need to do, in order to be, do, or have anything you want. How this book came about has been somewhat of a miracle. For weeks and months, I had struggled with how best to write and organize this book. I thought I would write it in a systematic way, covering as many common questions and misconceptions as possible. But when I tried to put my mind around the subject matter, more things related to the topic started to crop up and my conscious mind said, look, there is no way I can possibly put a handle around all that. So I decided to leave it to the divine, and up to the universe. This is a very important principle not only in manifestation, but also for creating everything else in our lives for every single moment of our life is a moment of creation. Every moment is a moment of manifestation. We are constantly molding and forming and shaping energy, with our thoughts, feelings, thoughts, words, and deeds, so how should writing a book be any different? Just this morning I was in the shower, and I suddenly had an inspiration to write a book in this particular manner. Forget about covering all the common questions, forget about using a step-by-step -step approach, forget about worrying or trying to write the perfect book on manifestations, my inner voice said. Instead, write it in this way. Write it like a handbook, give the secrets as you know them one at a time, take yourself out of the equation, and IT is done. And with that, I trusted and started writing. Secret 1 there is no fixed sequence for manifesting there is no fixed sequence or way to manifest anything. Our bookstores are filled with books and audio programs, one after another, telling you that they have discovered the latest secret or techniques for manifesting something. I used to buy into all of those, and you might have to. It took me more than 10 years to finally realize that the plain truth has been staring at me in my face all the time there is no fixed sequence or series of steps for manifesting anything. What works, is what works for you. And the sequence is different for every individual on the planet, because it is unique. It is funny but I have heard so many law of attraction success and failure stories. Some people tried the steps and had instant, almost miraculous manifestations. They hit the jackpot right away. Some others try the same series of steps and get nothing. 
I must not be doing something right, they say, so they buy more books and attend more seminars in an attempt to find out where they have gone wrong. They have not gone wrong. All they have done was to try out a series of steps that did not work for them. And all they have to do now is to find a series of steps that works for them. Chances are, the right manifestation sequence of them is not going to be word for word, something recommended by a teacher out there. It is probably something they have to experiment with to find out just the right recipe for them. I am constantly amazed by the individual differences, and how much uniqueness we bring to this planet. No two individuals are the same. We all have different preferences, we like different foods, we even look different, we have different sleeping habits. So why should all of us use the exact same manifestation steps? Why should there be only one right manifestation techniques or even just a handful of right techniques prescribed by the gurus out there? The great spiritual masters certainly didn't just teach a rigid series of steps. Yes, they certainly had broad principles that provided some kind of a framework, but our individual idiosyncrasies means that you have to do some tweaking to find what works for you. I approach deliberate creation and manifestation as somewhat of a game, and not a chore. I do not keep score based on how well I have followed all the steps, because I know that the suggested steps may not always work. But I am open enough to try anything that comes my way. So sometimes I'll add things and change things around according to my fancy, and then observe the results. The results have been really fascinating to me and is positive proof that all this stuff works. For example, there have been many instances in my life where I just had the mere intention of having something. It was more along the lines of, wouldn't it be nice if I had underscore 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 underscore. Then I thought nothing about it again and somehow, going about my daily life doing the usual things, those very things I had earlier very lightly intended would come into my life in the most harmonious way possible. I had wanted a mobile phone charger for my car, as these latest smartphones were always running out of battery before the end of the day. Isn't it nice that these ancient manifestation techniques always work and still work in the age of smartphones? Yet at the same time, I was a bit daunted by the prospect of having to drive to the store and shop for one. I had shopped for computer accessories before, and I knew that I had some serious comparison to do between the various brands and prices. Therefore I just dropped the thought completely. I did not agonize or worry over how the mobile phone charger was going to come into my life. About a week later, my cousin invited me to visit a car show. Normally I would avoid places with large crowds, but this time I felt a clear nudge and instinct to go. Everything seemed to line up and said yes, 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 and so off I went. I went despite rationally knowing that there was nothing I needed there. At the show, I bought a pair of excellent windscreen wipers, at half off their regular price, and along with that purchase was a free gift, a mobile phone car charger. Two wishes fulfilled without me having to do anything extraordinary or go out of the way. I tell the above story to illustrate a point. In this case, I did not religiously go through all three or five steps of the manifestation process. I did not write down my desires and visualize them fervently. I simply had a very light intention, let it go completely and it manifested in my life shortly after. I am sure you can find many other similar examples in your own life. If this is the case, then it certainly means that you are not only a masterful manifester, but it also means you're free from the need to follow any sequence or series of steps. Make up your own sequence and tweak it as you go along. Life is meant to be fun. Notice what has worked for you in the past. For me, I notice that when I state intentions in a certain way, things have happened for me. And that when I state intentions in another way, things do not seem to happen so easily for me. 
so what I do is that I take the first instance and study it, to see what lessons I can glean from it. I take all my successful manifestations and ask myself, what's common about all of them? In asking myself this question I focus on how I was feeling at that time, not so much of the things I did or the nature of objects that manifested. I approach manifestation scientifically, but I also maintain a childlike and playful attitude to it. Secret 2, it starts with an intention. Generally, there are a few principles to adhere to when attempting to be a deliberate and conscious creator. I will basically outline these principles here. While there are no rigid or fixed series of steps to adhere to, there are a number of very broad, universal principles that I've found to work for myself and countless others. The reason why these work is because they are aligned with the laws of the universe, and the basic fabric of how things operate in our universe. Broadly speaking, you always want to start with an intention. An intention is stating something you want, or a statement or thought about something which you want. Without an intention, there is no inception or starting thought, and consequently nothing happens. So think of an intention as a starting point, or a thought that sets into motion a series of observable actions and events. This is where free will comes in. We can set an intention about anything. We can desire anything. There is nothing too big or small for us to desire, and we can choose to have anything. There are absolutely no limits or limitations, because we do not even know what our limits or limitations are. You can state an intention in any way, but you do have to state it. Some people do not put their intention in words. They set an intention in terms of their thoughts or feelings, or from observing something, and the universe picks it up from there. One thing I've learned is that the universe is always there for us, it is unfailing. You do not have to worry about it being not present in our lives, or that it missed out on one of our intentions. Therefore there is no need to state an intention over and over again if you're clear and pure about it. Just once is enough. Any repetition is for your own conscious, reasoning mind only. Some people find it easier to state their intentions or desires formally in words. For example, they may write or say out loud, I intend underscore 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 underscore. Everything goes, and what works for you will be unique to you. Some other people leapfrog the saying or writing of intentions and go on to demonstrate faith through their actions, for example by clearing up a space in preparation for a new piece of furniture. Their action is also an intention, as it signals their intent for the new piece of furniture. The universe always picks up on your intention perfectly. As with everything else in this book, you are encouraged to find different ways to state your intention. Some people may find that nothing more than a thought is necessary, as is certainly the case with me for many of my manifestations. At other times, more than a thought may be necessary, and you may find a need to say it out loud, once, or more than once, or write it out, or even go through a ritual where you state the intention clearly. Bear in mind that no matter what form or method you adopt, only you know what works for you. There is no right or wrong method here, and be playful with it. Secret 3, the intention must be clear. The intention which you state must be clear. It must not be muddled up and bunched up with a whole lot of other things at once. However, you can state universal, broader intentions and those will work as well, as the universe will often fill in the details for you, even better than you can imagine or envision. Let's start by explaining what a clear intention means. A clear intention means working on one desired thing, object, or outcome at a time. Working on multiple intentions at the same time is often a recipe for confusion and non-manifestation. Therefore, if I want to manifest or attract a new watch, 
then I state the intention for that using the means I have explained in the last chapter. If you find that imagining yourself wearing the new watch is the best way for you to state your intention, then you would imagine yourself wearing the new watch and feeling pleased and happy. That is working on one single intention at a time. If you find that writing down your intention is the best way to get started, then I would write, I intend a new watch with leather strap. You can of course, fill in the model number and the brand as per your liking. That is stating your intention clearly and succinctly. In fact, it is the only job you have to do because the universal laws will take care of things from now on. Some people try to cram multiple things into their intention statements, like, I intend a new watch, a new dress, and a new car. Anytime you have the word and in your intention statements, you are making it difficult for the universe to fulfill your intentions because now it has to be all three of those things at once. On the other hand, if you write three separate statements, one for each item, you'll have much better success with them. So experiment with stating clear intentions, and start with small intentions. There is no difference between small and large intentions, and I've certainly had large intentions manifesting very quickly and small intentions taking more time. So the perceived size of the intention is not an issue. That is merely our own perception and our limitation we have placed on the matter. But for a start, work with setting intentions that are believable to you in your current realm and in your current system of beliefs. In the long term anything is possible, but remember that in the short term, you still have to work within your own system of beliefs and possibilities, which have been inadvertently limited by the choices and beliefs you made in the past. Practice stating intentions until they are clear. Secret 4, Getting Rid of Automatic Counter Intentions What do you do after you have stated an intention clearly? You generally want to make sure that there are no counter intentions, or that there are no negative thoughts or feelings that contradict that intention. This in itself takes practice and is something people find difficult to do. People often ask me, well, if manifestation is really as simple as you say, and we simply have to think about what we want. Why is it that more people are not doing it, or why is it that we still have to work so hard? Why doesn't everyone do it? You get the idea. The steps behind manifestation are simple and easy in theory, but understanding them and applying them may take a lifetime because it requires some serious inner work. As mentioned earlier in my introduction, the universe and your inner self knows exactly how you feel at every moment. You may be able to conceal your true feelings to the outside world but you can never fool yourself. Your inner self is aware of how you feel about every subject, all of the time. Here's where it gets tricky, when you have a pure intention, all is well and good. Things will manifest and happen for you very quickly. For example, when you set a pure intention to have a new watch, things will line up and happen for you very quickly once your intention is pure. However, most people also typically, and due to societal conditioning, do one of these things after setting an intention, immediately, they worry how they are going to get it. They worry that they are not able to afford it. They worry about whether they are doing the right things. They worry about whether they deserve it. All of these thoughts that come immediately after you have stated your initial intention and desires are also intentions as well. And they'll be picked up by the universe just as well, without any discrimination. The universe does not discriminate between good or bad thoughts. The content of the thoughts do not matter, and hence morality or ethics does not play a part here. If you really desire something bad to happen to someone, and you are able to think that supposed bad thought purely, then it will happen. The converse is of course true. If you desire something good to happen, and think it purely, it will happen as well. Goodness or badness are simply value judgments we place on things. 
Therefore when you state an initial intention, observe and be aware of all the other counter-intentions that pop up in your mind and that you feel simultaneously. Do you feel any negative thoughts or feelings concurrently? If you do, those are going to be picked up and acted on by the universe as well. What it means, of course, is that nothing happens because they cancel each other out? If you say, I want to have a new car as your initial intention statement, but then you non-verbally say, but I cannot afford it, notice what you have just done. You have set two intentions that are the exact opposite of one another. The moment you set the first intention, the universe has acted on it with precision. But then you had countered it immediately with thoughts or feelings of not being able to afford it, and the universe acted on that too. Yes, you cannot afford it becomes the reality which you create. So things are really not as easy or simple as they seem. Manifestation takes a lot of inner work, but hey, it's inner work that is fun to me and that I'm willing to take the time to do. You may decide and you have complete free will, that you do not want to do the inner work, that you do not want to improve your deliberate creation skills and that is completely alright as well. The key here is to train yourself to state an intention purely, without any negative or impure thoughts that may taint it, as all of those feelings, and thoughts, as a whole, are also picked up by the universe. Therefore I encourage you to start with something small, like the case of the mobile phone charger. The manifestation happened so quickly and effectively for me because my intention was very pure, and there were no other negative or limiting intentions for the universe to pick up on. All it picked up was my purest, cleanest intention of having a mobile phone charger. Had I gone on about how I was unable to afford a mobile phone charger, or that they were in limited supply, I would have thrown all of those into the manifestation mix as well which would then have to be sorted out. What have you thrown into your manifestation mix? Usually, the things that we have been struggling for a long time take such a long time precisely because we have so much garbage thrown into the manifestation mixed bag. We have so many loaded desires and intentions that tag along with the original intention, Whereas if we are able to find a way to think of that original intention purely, it will come very fast. The great spiritual teachers Abraham Hicks say, your vibration doesn't have to be strong, it just has to be pure. You don't have to think about something over and over again. You just have to think about it purely. You just have to not contradict it with your own vibration. Secret 5 the faster you let it go, the faster it comes. So what do you do after you have stated an intention purely? Do you have to keep repeating it? If you have read until here, you'll know there is nothing more you have to do. Once is enough, and your request is now acted upon by the universe with mathematical and formulaic precision. I know, because I have experienced it countless times in my life, and I'm sure you too, have a deep understanding and recognition that this is also true in your own life. We mentioned in the previous chapters that the universe is impersonal. The universe does not care what you ask for, or what thoughts you are thinking. You may be thinking or rehearsing positive thoughts, and the universe picks up and acts on them. All is then well in your world or you may be rehashing negative thoughts over and over again with lots of feeling and emphasis. Guess what, the universe picks up and acts on those as well. If the universe is a selective one and only chose to act on our good thoughts, then we would be limited in our options and thus not have free will. We are all free to create, within the boundaries and framework of this space-time reality, whether what we create brings us greater happiness, or greater unhappiness. This is the ultimate freedom. Therefore do not wish that the universe only act on our positive thoughts, neither should you wish that you live in a universe where negative thoughts do not arise. The universe cannot, and does not choose for us. Ultimately, 
we choose the thoughts we think, and we're free to choose from a myriad of possibilities through carefully selecting our thoughts. I see negative thoughts as representing that we have the ultimate freedom to choose, create, and explore. It's like how the old saying goes, you can choose to be unhappy, if that makes you happy. After you have thought or stated an intention purely, the next step is to let IT go. This is truly everything that you have to do, that is your work, in the manifestation and creative process. Many people, especially rational, scientific thinkers, in our society have trouble with this. They cannot accept something as happening without their intervention, or something that happens without their being involved in it. If you wish to be a powerful conscious creator, then you have to accept that there is a portion of the work that is done by you, and there is a portion of the work that is done by something that is greater than you. In the previous chapters of this book, we have already covered the portion of the work that is done by you specifically, you are needed in the process to decide what to do want. You are needed in the process to choose, to clarify what you do want, such that the intention is clear and pure. Your permission is needed for something to happen. And until then, the universe cannot act on it. You give this permission by virtue of your thoughts, words, and deeds. Now here's the part that is not your work, figuring out how to make something happen is not your work. Figuring how it will come to you is not your work. Doing lots of physical action. To force something to happen is not your work. The universe is simply set up this way and does not need your physical help. It however, requires, that you give your permission and set the creative process into motion by exercising your creative powers of imagination and choice. This is what the great spiritual teachers have been telling us all along. Florence Scovel Shin, whom I greatly admire, and also wrote additional modern explanatory texts for one of her books, is big on using the imagination to visualize and create, because in so using your imagination, you are calling upon your God-given creative powers. Only you can exercise those powers. In deciding what you want in your life, you are exercising those powers. But after you have decided upon what you want and how you would want it, relax and let everything go. Don't even think about it again. If you do think about it again, think about it in a positive way, as if the desire has already manifested. See it as already true. One worry that people always have is that if we do not think about our desires over and over again, they will not manifest. This can't be further from the truth. Once is enough. One clear and purely stated intention is enough, and everything is done. You do not have to keep repeating your affirmations and desires over and over again, unless of course, doing so helps to purify your intention and reduce any feelings of resistance. A common pitfall of most people is that they frequently visualize or write down affirmations over and over again, to the point of sheer desperation. These people are trying too hard. Conscious manifestation is not so difficult, and while it takes a lot of inner work, it does not involve writing out your affirmations or doing visualizations all day long. Recall in the previous chapter when we discussed how intentions can be set in various ways. You can set an intention either by thinking about it or feeling it, saying it out loud, writing it down, or even through your actions. The fourth way, using actions to set intentions, is often a double-edged sword. When used right, it can bring about some very powerful demonstrations. For example, you can take an action of faith and purchase an expensive item, knowing that the money will come to you. That is setting an intention through an action of faith. However, this works the other way as well. When someone continually repeats and writes affirmations, what kind of intention is he setting with his actions? What is he affirming or actually intending? Is he intending or affirming the presence of something, 
that through his actions, something will manifest very soon, or the lack of something, that because he does not have it yet, he has to affirm it repeatedly? This is a question only the individual can answer. No one can answer it for you, because no one can accurately have a glimpse of your inner state. However, as I've mentioned several times throughout this book, the universe can. The universe unfailingly picks up on every single signal you send out. Therefore, if you are writing affirmations or doing visualizations all day long, then be careful of the possibility that through your actions, you may be sending out signals of desperation and affirming the lack of something, instead of the presence of something. Think about this for a moment. If something you wanted is now in your possession, how would you feel? If you are now driving your dream car, or in possession of something which you desire, would you still be writing affirmations stating, I now have underscore 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 or I now drive underscore 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 underscore. That would be totally absurd. You have something, and it's yours, and that's the end of it. It would be real to you. Now here's the secret, bring that feeling of reality to the present moment. Not somewhere out there in the future but into your present moment, right now. Don't think of it in terms of something that is unfulfilled, or something that is still out there, which you still have to get. Think and talk about it in terms of something happening in your reality right now. If you have the item right now, how would you behave? If you have the item right now, how would you feel? What would you be doing? Would you be giving thanks, or would you be writing affirmations that you have that item? This is a very important principle to get, and once again it provides ample opportunities for practice. Practice taking something that is real in your life right now, that you currently have. Feel what it is like to have it. Then take something that is not currently in physical form, something you want but only exists in energy at the moment. Feel the difference in how you perceive the two items. Switch back and forth between the two feelings or representations until there is no difference between them, or make the unmanifest item feel as real as the real one. Do so until you feel no distinction between the two. You would have truly let go, completely, and it would come very fast. Secret 6, What is Real, Anyway? In the introduction to this book, I made the rather cryptic statement about how everything is real, whether it is manifest or unmanifest. Things that are manifest are those in our physical plane, things which we can touch and feel and sense with our five senses. Things that are unmanifest are things that are in our spiritual, non-physical, plane, things that are not yet manifest in reality. Do you make a strong distinction between these two groups? Do you frequently talk about how certain things are manifest and real in your life, and how certain of your desires have not manifested? I encourage you to blur the lines a little, because once you do, then things can certainly get a lot more fun and exciting for you. Let's suppose that you are looking to create a new car. It doesn't matter what you are trying to create, but for purposes of explanation, let us use the common example of a car. Suppose that you are so in love with this car that you have created it in your mind and visualized it in great detail. You know what color the car is going to be, you know what trim it is going to come in, how the engine sounds, and even how it smells like. Now suppose someone comes along and asks you a question about this car, do you think you would be able to answer them? Of course, you would. You would be able to speak about this car and describe this car in as much detail as you would, a real, physical car. So what is real anyway? Is the car in your unmanifest reality, your imagination, any less real than the car in your manifest reality, your three-dimensional reality? I would think both are equally real, because at any moment and point in time, you're able to access both realities equally. 
you have equal access to both cars, so to speak. Now of course some people may argue that the car in the unmanifest reality cannot be experienced with the five physical senses, but if you really think about it, that's as far as the differences go. Those are the only differences between the car in your imagination and the car in reality. So the line between your imagination and reality may be much more fuzzy than you think it actually is. Of course, the million dollar question is this, what does it take for the car, or any other object, in my unmanifest reality to pop and create itself in reality? Do I need to do something? Do I need to do anything extra? Or perhaps I am doing something wrong? The good news is that once the car exists on the spiritual plane, the yet unmanifest reality, then it is on its way to existing in the physical plane, your manifest reality. Once the car exists on the physical plane, a version of it continues to exist on the spiritual plane. Manifestation, then, is the process of bringing that car from nothingness, through the energetic spiritual plane, into the energetic physical plane which you can then perceive with your senses. Why is it important to know what manifestation or creation is? I feel it is useful to work with a clear idea of what the creative process really is. The creative process is not something mystical or mysterious. It is certainly not magic or out there. We all possess the innate ability to shape and manipulate energy, and in fact we are doing it all the time. I am molding energy as I am writing these words. I am also translating the energy of my thoughts into words, which you, as the reader, are then picking up and translating based on your own energy. We do all of this so naturally and easily, it comes so easily to us, without any struggle or strain at all because that is what we have been born to do. We have all been born to mold and work directly with energy, shaping it and creating our desired outcomes out of this energy. We are constantly bringing things out of nothingness, into the spiritual plane, and then subsequently into the physical plane. Of course, sometimes we change our minds and change our these items look like in the spiritual plane, leading them to change on the physical plane as well. At other times we change our minds and create something totally new instead, which means we choose to start all over again on the spiritual plane and create something else. You are already an expert creator. It is so true when the ancient spiritual teachers say there is nothing more you have to do, in order to be, do, or have anything you want. What they are essentially teaching is that you already have all the tools at your disposal, and hopefully this book has clarified the usage of some of those tools. Isn't it a relief to know that you're already doing this, day in day out, and all you need now is just some fine-tuning and some focus to create something that is really beautiful and desirous to you? Isn't it a wonderful feeling to know that you don't need to go out and buy a magic wand just to make things happen? because whatever you need, and everything you have always needed, has always been available to you right from the start? If you accept the premise in this book that we are constantly working with energy, and that we constantly mold, manipulate, shape and direct energy through our intentions, thoughts, words, feelings and deeds and that directed energy can ultimate result in tangible manifestations, then you are well on your way to shaping your own life and creating your own future. What you wish to create, is entirely up to you. Secret 7, Stop Trying to Figure Things Out Before I set off to become a conscious creator and manifester, I would constantly try to figure things out. The moment I set an intention, let's say, to have a certain amount of money, my conscious, reasoning mind would immediately envision possible ways that money was going to come to me. Very often, it would be a very convoluted series of steps involving many things happening, but I just couldn't stop myself from imagining all the possible ways the money was coming to me. This was my rational, reasoning, left brain trying to interfere with the process and outcome, with no good results. In hindsight, 
knowing what I know today, I now realize how I was closing myself off to the possibilities. Each of those ways that I had reasoned and consciously come up with, were also a myriad of intentions by themselves. In other words, I was trying to dictate to the universe how exactly something should happen, and making things more complicated for myself than I had to. Nowadays when I state an intention, I immediately resist the urge, and this simply means giving up the need, to figure out all the ways it can possibly happen. Remember I stated in the introduction that the moment we visualize a possible outcome, we are choosing one possible outcome out of all the endless possibilities which may not even be the best outcome for us. We are unknowingly limiting our options by forcing things through, and often delaying our manifestations, using whatever limited knowledge is available from our physical perspectives. Whereas if we are willing to open up to the universe, and have faith in a higher power that always ensures our well-being, things would unfold just as they should. So when I say stop trying to figure out how your desires will come true to you, stop trying to figure out both the means, method, and also the timing through which it will come to you. The great spiritual teachers have repeatedly taught us that there is no delay, and that there is no lag, and that all delays are self-imposed. Everything will come when our intention is pure, and when we are ready for it. Secret 8, How to Speed Things Up I hope the last few chapters have given you a fundamental and advanced understanding of the manifestation process. It is really nothing more complicated than that. The focus of most manifestation books out there, which unfortunately, adds on to the misinformation, is on following the right series of steps and doing the right things, leading to much confusion for the majority of readers. However, manifestation is easier than that. All it takes is the understanding of a few broader principles and the willingness to experiment, have fun and play along. Of course, I could have padded this book with way more stories and allegories in order to make it thicker, but that would have detracted from my purpose of writing these books. I want to be a clear channel for the most effective universal messages to you, such that you can apply them directly in your own lives, with the minimum of effort. Minimal effort does not mean that no effort is needed. As explained, there is considerable inner work to be undertaken if you want to be a grand master at manifesting what you consciously desire. In my years of writing and teaching, I have not met a single individual who is totally hopeless at manifesting, reaffirming the truth that we all have the innate ability to create and manifest. To be totally unable to manifest means to be totally devoid of creative abilities, which goes against the nature of our being. So no matter where you are and what results you've had in the past, don't lose heart. Maybe you are making it out to be more of a chore than you need to. Turn it into child's play, make it into a game. There are no rules apart from the broad principles we went through earlier, so make up your own as you go along and notice what works. Self-awareness is important here in spotting the patterns that work for you. If at any time you're not having fun with this creative stuff, you're trying too hard. You're putting in more effort than necessary. So use the amount of fun and enjoyment you're having as a gauge. As I was manifesting this book, I used my own emotions as a gauge. Anytime it felt like work, like I was forcefully phrasing and putting words on paper. I stopped. It showed in my writing too. The writing sounded forceful and contrived, somewhat artificial. But the moment I just trusted my inner self to produce the best possible book in physical form, the words came pouring without much intervention needed on my part. Life can be easy, if you let it be. The quintessential question that I always get about manifestations and the creative process is this, how can I speed things up? How can I make things happen faster? Hopefully, if you have read until here, you'll have some idea about what the answer is going to be. First, 
understand and realize that there is no delay. The moment you ask, the universe answers. If, and this a big if, your intentions are clear. But if you ask, and then start wondering about how long it will take, or even start worrying or feeling impatient, then guess what you're throwing your feelings of impatience into the whole manifestation mixed bag. And the universe is going to do its utmost best to give you that mixed bag, which may well end up to be more delay, and more reasons for impatience. That's why effective manifestations and deliberate creations seem to elude so many people. They do not understand that the very universal laws they are harnessing are working both for and against them, at the very same time. All you need to do is to strip out the portion that does not work, through your inner work. I can promise and assure you, and this comes from my own personal experience, that if you are able to think about an intention, about what you want, very purely, without any of the usual worries or negative thoughts, the thing you want will come very fast. The manifestation of it will seem almost instant to you, and it will shock you. But you can trick the universe into it. You cannot pretend to be not worried because the universe picks up on all of your feelings and thoughts. You must genuinely be unworried, carefree and not give two hoots about whether and how your manifestation will come, then it will come. Neville can't be closer to the truth when he said, feeling is the secret, but there is much more that meets the eye when he said that statement. Neville was obviously someone who knew these ancient and irrefutable laws of the universe. What I would do, if I were you, is to prove it to myself using something that is seemingly small. I use the word seemingly because everything is a matter of perception, and big or small things are simply a matter of relative perception. Something may be big to you, but small to another person living on the same street. So it is all relative and size absolutely does not play a part in the manifestation process. But for the purposes of this thought experiment, pick something small so that you stack the deck on your side. Pick something small and set an intention that you know you'll have very little counter intentions against. Pick a subject matter where you feel very comfortable about, where there will be no negative or worrying thoughts. Then follow the steps in this book and see how natural, or even magically, that thing manifests for you without any seeming effort on your part. That is the true art of manifestation. And after you have done the process once and proven to yourself that it works, then you can do it over and over again. In time to come if you're feeling a little more adventurous, you can then move on to subject matters that you don't feel so comfortable about that you perhaps have some resistance about, for a lot of people, this tends to be money or finances. Pick something small and set a small intention within that subject matter, and then go through the same series of steps. Do your best to keep negative or counter thoughts to the minimum, and notice whether it works. Since you picked something small, there is a high chance it will work and you would have truly mastered the creative art of manifestation. In fact, even without embarking on the experiment I have outlined in the previous two paragraphs, you can prove it to yourself in your life right now. Pick something which has always come easily to you, which you have always been good at. And then notice how, when you want that something, be it good grades, good results in a particular area of your life, or certain items related to that subject matter that you always instinctively know how to achieve it. It is as if you were guided each step along the way towards your goal. That is the universe leading you, and it is you executing the moves of being a deliberate and conscious creator. Now you may say, oh, but this comes easily to you. But don't be so quick to dismiss it just yet. Sit and notice for a moment why it comes easily to you. What is so different about this topic at hand that is different from another topic that you are struggling with? Let me give you a personal example. I have always had great success manifesting good academic results. It came very easily to me, 
so you can say that is an area of my life where I do not have much counter intentions and negative thoughts about. For you, it may be another area. It may be good health, good athletic performance, good financial abundance, good relationships. It may be in several of these areas or even all of them, in which case you're an excellent conscious creator. Of course, the eventual goal of reading this book and practicing the principles within is to help you become a conscious creator in all areas of your life. Back to my example, I have always had great success manifesting good academic results, but I have not had as much success being good at sports. You can do this exercise along with me as you are reading. Pick two areas of your life, one which you are good at manifesting results in, and the other which you are not so good, still learning, to manifest results in. For example, some people are good at creating good health but not so good at creating money. The converse is true for other people, which fascinates me to no end because it truly proves that these laws work, it's just how you apply them. Think about the area of your life which works for you, where the results come fairly easily. Think about your attitudes in that area, and your beliefs in that area. How do you instinctively know what to do? What is the feeling when you want to achieve something in that area? I know that when I think about achieving good academic results, I never once worry about it. Deep down inside I have a strong and persistent belief that I can do it. There is almost a sense of relaxed confidence about the whole thing. I never once doubt my abilities in this area. Now when I think about mastering a new sport, for example tennis, I instantly feel, in my inner awareness, a shift of these feelings. I shift from being calm, relaxed and confident to doubting my own abilities. I start to worry about doing things right, I start to wonder if I can do it. Interesting isn't it? How two different areas of our lives can evoke such different feelings, and as Neville says, feeling is the secret. Now here's an even bigger secret, you don't even have to change anything on the outside. You just have to change things on the inside and see the corresponding physical reality change on the outside. I can simply change the feelings I have about tennis to one of ease and joy, to banish the worries I have about it, and not worry about whether I'm doing things right. Of course, it will take some mental practice at first, and it might even seem weird at first. But understand that any weirdness you feel about this process is because you have been thinking the same thoughts regarding a particular subject area for too long. Therefore, the sudden changing of thoughts will produce new and unfamiliar feelings. It's just like using your right hand to write all along, and suddenly switching to your left hand. It feels totally different. But it is nothing bad. Instead, if you stick with it, if you impose and ease yourself into your new feelings about a particular subject matter, notice that we're doing this all in our mind, then things will start to change for you on the outside. For a start, pick a subject area which you do not have very strong resistance about, and over time, you'll be able to change more and more areas of your life. Recently I started picking up golf after a long lull period. I decided to put these principles into action. Instead of worrying about whether I was hitting the ball right or whether I was doing the right things, or whether everything would turn out the way I wanted. I asked myself how would I feel if this is something I'm confident about. I then transposed the feelings from an area of my life where I was confident about into my playing of golf, and instantly my golf swings straightened themselves out. The balls started flying further and higher. I had much more fun playing, and less blisters on my fingers. It was as if I added years of hard work and practice to my game. All I did, was to have an inner shift in feelings about the subject matter. You are always creating and manifesting something, even when you're not realizing it. You may think nothing is happening, but everything is happening. 
you may think you are creating nothing, but right at that moment, you are actually creating something. So why not create something that makes you happy and pleases you? Why waste the unlimited amount of energy that you have at your fingertips? The ancient spiritual masters have told us, time and time again, that the amount of energy we have access to is limitless. There is no limit to the amount of energy we can call upon and harness with our thoughts, and I can quote from every major spiritual teacher who has some kind of analogy about how much energy equivalents our thoughts carry. The amount of energy that our concentrated desires and thoughts carry is enough to send a rocket to the moon. I'll repeat that again, the amount of energy that our concentrated desires and thoughts carry is enough to send a rocket to the moon. We virtually have an unlimited amount of energy at our fingertips. But what do most people use this energy for? They waste it. They waste it on worries and doubts, and in confidence. They waste it on desperation and impatience. After all, it takes energy to feel all these feelings. More accurately, you feel those feelings because you are perceiving slash translating the energy. Of course, all this creation does not go to waste, remember, the universe does not discriminate between good and bad, which means more negative situations of worries, doubts and impatience are created for you, over and over again. Why not flip a switch and turn it around today? Why not use the limitless energy that is available to you and flowing through you to create joy and abundance in all forms? It is all possible and up to you. No one can choose for you, and that is the sweetness of having ultimate freedom as a creator. Secret 9, Silence the Reasoning, Rational Mind All religions and spiritual teachings throughout the ages talk about the concept of faith. What then, is the concept of faith? It seems to be such an abstract concept that it is lost on us modern folks today, and yet it is an absolutely crucial and integral part of the manifestation process. Very often, you'll hear a spiritual teacher say, you'll just have to have faith in the process. What does this really mean? Recall that earlier on I talked about seeing the unmanifest reality as indistinguishable from the physical reality, even though you cannot yet experience the outcome with your five senses. That is having, and keeping the faith. Faith is simply seeing and believing something that is not in physical form yet, and you keep the faith by seeing and believing it so strongly, there is no difference between the thing being in physical form, or it being in non-physical, spiritual, form. I have said over and over again throughout this book that when you reach that stage, whatever you want happens for you very quickly. And if you do not reach that inner state, then it may very well take a while more. What prevents most people from keeping the faith? For one, they can't stop the mind chatter that their conscious, reasoning, rationalizing mind makes. As one of my friends said, I understand the law of attraction and the creation process intellectually, but I cannot bring myself to fully have faith and trust in the process. What this friend was actually saying, is that while he understands how everything works, he does not have enough faith in the process. He does not have enough faith in that the universe will bring him what he wants, and therefore he often has to figure out what action to take to bring it to him. If you wish to speed up your manifestations or greatly ramp up your conscious creation effectiveness, then this is helpful to you, silence the conscious, rational mind. Stop questioning, intellectualizing, debating and wondering how something will happen, or what will happen next. Stop dictating that things will happen in a particular way, or in a particular time frame. In other words, you stop reasoning with the divine because that is not your job. Your job is simply to decide what you want to create, and let it go. For most people, this is next to impossible to put into action. The good news is that if you have been meditating or been in any form of spiritual practice over the years, 
then this may come easily for you. You'll already know how to reach a place of inner peace, or how to reduce the incessant mind chatter surrounding your intentions. This is simply known as trusting the universe, letting go, and letting God. For most of us who are used to the Western way of education and questioning, letting go of the need to question seems so fundamentally different from the way we have been taught to operate in this world, but yet it is possible. And as I've realized, it can come without years of spiritual practice. I've found that students often stumble or get stuck at the point of letting go. While I can intuitively explain all the other steps of the creative process, as I've done in the preceding chapters of this book, the act of letting go is much more difficult to put into words. It can either take up lots of words, or very few words. It is something experiential in nature, and until you have learned to truly let go and let God, these five words will just seem like a mantra to you. I've seen people going around repeating this phrase, when it was obvious they were not letting go and letting God. So I knew I needed another way to teach the concept of letting go. Let's first start with the method of teaching one how to let go, with the fewest words possible. I can sum up the whole method in four words, you just do IT. It's that simple. You just do IT. You just decide to do it and do it. But for most people, our egos and intellectual, reasoning minds are so persistent that we cannot and will not leave it at that. We just have to have answers as to how something will work, or we just have to ensure that we have a safety net. So obviously, this first method of instruction is not going to work for a lot of people. The second method takes a lot of words and will take you through logically and persuasively, why it is best to let go. I'm going to skip that method and instead explain a third method. Which I have been using very effectively for myself and for many others. Don't get me wrong here, it is not wrong to question anything. The Buddha himself asked his disciples to question everything. For it is through the process of questioning that you arrive at the truth. Yet, the Buddha, or any other spiritual master for that matter, never questioned whether something was going to work for them. They just did it. They never questioned the veracity or validity of these spiritual and universal laws. They just used them. They trusted in them implicitly and totally. Correspondingly, it worked for them. This third method I've found to be highly effective for letting go is to simply engage or distract the conscious mind. In fact, it is so effective that you can skip years of spiritual practice and just do this directly, as I have found. Here's the gist of the method, what you do is that instead of attempting to silence your curious, rational mind, which is next to impossible, you engage and occupy it with something else. You let it do something else, and have some kind of a hook to wrap itself around and occupy itself with such that it does not interfere with the manifestation process. What this means is that you will increase your effectiveness as a conscious creator, because then your rational, questioning mind will not trip you up every step along the way. The way I do so is with the help of manifestation cards. I developed manifestation cards originally as a tool, and as a manifestation aid, for myself, after studying and questioning how the manifestation process worked. I'm not saying that your reasoning faculties are useless or unnecessary. In fact, without my reasoning faculties, I would not have been able to come up with this tool to help me along further in my manifestation adventures. The purpose of these manifestation cards are to engage the conscious reasoning mind, such that it has something else to do while you are stating your intention, and will not sabotage itself with negative or limiting beliefs. Remember that the conscious mind merely knows its limitations, based on your past experiences. So if you have never created $50,000 in your life before and now want to set an intention to create it, your conscious mind simply puts forth the suggestion, well, 
you have never even created that amount before, so how are you going to do it? Let's start thinking of rational ways where this can possibly happen, and before you know it, it starts coming with ways where this might possibly happen. If you analyze all the possible solutions suggested by your conscious mind, you'll find that they are all based on one thing, what you currently know, your existing knowledge, and to a certain extent, what you believe is currently possible. For most people, this will be things like winning the lottery, or getting an inheritance. These are the conventions we have all been exposed to. But your unconscious mind knows better. Your higher self knows better. That part of you that is connected with the universe and with divinity knows better. It knows that there are unlimited ways for something to come into your life, and that anything is possible, but your conscious mind does not know that. Thus listening to your conscious, reasoning faculties actually limits you here. You are actually limiting the scope of probable outcomes if you believe in the reasoning processes undertaken by your conscious mind. You bring the conscious, reasoning mind out of the picture by giving it something to do, and helping it make sense of the whole manifestation process. The conscious, reasoning mind stems from the ego, and the ego believes it has to protect you from danger. The rational mind, ego, believes that if you stop thinking, you will cease to exist. That is why so many of us have an endless stream of thoughts flowing through our heads, all day, every day. For most people, they have identified so much with their thoughts that they think they are their thoughts. They see themselves as inseparable from those thoughts, and those thoughts as who they are. If you asked them to completely stop thinking for even a minute, their egos get so terrified because they think they'll die. This incident happened to me years ago when I was meditating, and I was suddenly gripped with immense and profound fear. I had fallen prey to the mistaken belief that I would cease to exist and function as a human being the moment I stopped conscious thought. It seems amusing to me now, but the fear felt very real to me back then. Of course, all of that is untrue and merely one of the ego's ways to get us to agree with its rationalizations. The ego's rationalizations are nothing more than stories, and as I've mentioned in the introduction, when you believe in a story, you are simply believing in one version of reality and collapsing all possibilities into that one reality. In the next and final chapter, I'll talk about the manifestation cards process and how you can use it for more effective manifestations. Secret 10, Manifestation Cards Manifestation cards are a tool to aid you with your manifestations. They are not a mystical, divination or supernatural tool of any kind. There is no power in the cards themselves, and the power arises from the way you use them because when you use these cards as suggested and play along with them, you invoke certain important universal principles that will aid you in your manifestations. Remember, there are no fixed rules. There is no fixed sequence to manifestation. Do and use what works for you. If this works for you and makes you feel good, do it. Otherwise, use another tool or invent your own tool. Over time you'll find that you do not need any of these tools or aids, any more than you need your own intention and imagination. These tools are always here to assist. I created my own manifestation cards by taking a normal blank index or business card. On one side of the card, I write the following words. I intend underscore 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 underscore. I fill in the blank with whatever I want to create. It can be a physical object, an experience, a state of mind, or any object, tangible or intangible. There are no limits here, and this can truly be anything. The only caveat is that I only focus on one item per card. I only state one intention per card. I do not write something like I intend a new house and a new job. For that, I use two cards, one for the house, 
and one for the job. It is all right though to write the details of the same house and same job on the card. For example, I intend a Rolex watch with gold bracelet. It is all right to be specific about our intents, and to include as much detail as possible on the card without detracting from clarity. Next, I write the following sentence. I intend this or something better, for the highest good of all involved. The universe always gives us what we intend or something better, but this is some sort of an insurance policy for the reasoning mind. This puts the reasoning mind at ease, and it also illustrates an important universal principle. Very often, we do not know whether something we so fervently ask for is truly the highest and best for you. We may think it is the highest and best from our limited vantage points, but if we really manage to look at the whole scheme of things, from the perspective of the universe, we may then realize that it may not be such a good idea after all. Therefore, there are always limitations to our physical perspective. I can't even begin to tell you the number of stories where people asked for and insisted upon what they really wanted, only to discover after the fact that the universe had much better and grander plans in store for them. Therefore, the addition of this sentence is to signal your intention to be open to anything that is better, that is in line with the highest and best for you. And after this, I add the following four words, and it is so. These are four very powerful words. Let's take a look at what we have done here, you have stated your intention very clearly and succinctly. Remember that the universe always picks up on your intentions and acts on them. You then signal that you are always open to something better, and signal your desire for something to happen for the highest good of all involved. Because if you are going to get something, you want to make sure that it benefits everyone around you. Finally, you end off by saying, and it is so, which really means IT is done. Your job is done. It is final and complete as you write those words and there is nothing more you have to do. You truly let go and let the universe fly with your desire. You can see a sample of how a manifestation card looks like at www.manifestationcards.com. You can also read more about the science behind manifestation cards including how I was inspired to embed various sacred ancient teachings into my own manifestation cards, which I use on a daily basis. The first time I used these manifestation cards, I had two intentions come true on the very first day. Things which I thought were difficult and were going to take some time, but they actually manifested themselves effortlessly, and all I did was to go along with them. After you write these manifestation cards, there is truly nothing more you have to do. The act of writing your intentions down on these manifestation cards engages the need of the reasoning, rational mind to do something. If you want to, you can carry the card around in your wallet and take it out from time to time to look at it. Each time you look at it, Feel the feelings of the manifestation already occurring and remember that there is no difference between something that is manifest, in physical reality, and something that is not yet manifest, in spiritual reality. Everything is constantly moving through form, into form, and out of form. Or you can simply keep the card in your pocket and reach inside your pocket to touch and feel it once in a while. No one else has to know what you are doing and doing so evokes positive and powerful feelings that the universe picks up on. I personally put my manifestation cards into a beautiful box after I have written them, knowing that I have sent a clear and strong signal to the universe and there is nothing I have to do. I also write a universal manifestation card, stating that whatever I put into the manifestation box will materialize for me. In this way, I am doing multiple layers of manifestations and I know I am free to change my mind at any time. If I change my mind about something, I simply remove the corresponding card from the manifestation box and replace it with something else. Once again, 
all these rituals are merely for the purpose of engaging the conscious, reasoning mind and to satisfy the need to do something on our part. When in essence, a clear and pure intention is all that is necessary. But I have so much fun doing the whole process that I'm going to milk it as much as possible. If it feels good for you, keep doing it. Otherwise, stop. In the last section of this book, I'll talk about the role of action in the manifestation and creative process. Secret 11, The Sacred Role of Action Critics of the law of attraction, or of the manifestation and creative process frequently raise this question, does this mean that if I follow the steps explained earlier, that no action at all is needed on my part? This point of no action needed is frequently used to question the validity and soundness of the steps we have gone through earlier. This always amuses me greatly, because there is a great deal of action involved, even in thought. You would know by now the amount of inner work you have to do in order to reach a state of alignment. By this, we mean a state whereby your intentions are pure, and you feel totally at ease with your desires and manifestations. This is also a state where you feel a sense of relaxed calmness and positive expectancy, knowing deep down inside that what you want will come to you at the right time, and it is not your job to worry about how or when. Trust me, there is quite a great deal of action and inner work needed to reach this stage of letting go. As I've also repeatedly mentioned, when you finally reach this inner state of being at peace with everything, the things you want, on the outer, physical plane, will materialize very quickly. I guess what the critics are referring to is outer, physical action. They are talking about visible action we would need to take in the outer world, without realizing that most of the work with manifestation is in fact done internally. The inner work is all that you need to do, and any outer work, you'll be led to do. Let me put that differently, the inner work is mandatory, and the outer work is optional. You only do the outer work and take all the external, physical actions when inspired and led to do so. I call this taking the path of least resistance. When I state my intention clearly and let it go, I remain open to all possibilities. I am careful not to let my conscious thoughts interfere with that intention, so I am mindful not to get ahead of myself in any way. I know that the universe knows what is best for me, and I let the universe decide for me. This is truly what it means to let go. I let the universe lead and guide me, as to how that intention can materialize in my life. For example, when I state the intention for something new in my life, one of my first reactions may be to buy it outright. If that feels right for me, if it is the path of least resistance for me, then I go out and buy it. So the physical action involved here is inspired action, which involves me going out and buying the item. But many times, the act of purchasing the item outright does not feel right to me. I may then wait to see what other signal the universe gives. At other times an item may be given to me, as with the case of that mobile phone charger. In other cases, I have been led or gently nudged to go to a certain place, the library, where my eyes fell just on the right book at the right moment, giving me access to a rare book by a small independent publisher that would have been difficult to purchase. So the universe always knows the easiest and shortest way to your desires. Your job is to listen to its gentle nudges and signs. There was another time I was in a clothing store, and received a clear urge to walk over to a rack of trousers. Since I had been in that store before, I knew that those rack of trousers were some of the most expensive trousers in the store, costing hundreds of dollars each. That was something I would not usually spend on trousers. But it was a clear nudge given by the universe, and I walked over anyway. Imagine my surprise when I saw that the rack of trousers had been marked down, and were just $50 each. I left the store that day with a new pair of trousers, 
just as I had wanted, and a new, wonderful success story for this book. I love this trousers story so much because it contains all the elements necessary to teach the art of manifestation. First, somewhere along the way when I first saw those trousers on a previous visit, I, unconsciously, set up an intention to own a pair of them. Remember, the universe always picks up on your feelings and intent, whether you are consciously sending them out or otherwise. Even if you may not have formally worded your intentions or gone through the ritual of writing that particular intention down on paper, the universe still picks up on it. It does not discriminate though between good thoughts or bad thoughts. Next, since I let go of the intention and desire so completely, the universe had plenty of time to work its magic. When I was next back in the store, the universe sent me a nudge to check those trousers out, because at that point in time, it would have been the most expedient, effective and harmonious way to get those pair of trousers in my hands, or on me. When you begin to think about the elements, the amount of physical action that must be taken to orchestrate something like that, you truly start to appreciate that things happen on a scale we can never manage on our own, physically at least. No amount of physical action would have allowed me to dictate that those trousers go on sale, and then for me to walk into the store at just the right window of time when the trousers were on sale to purchase them. It's mind-boggling, to put it simply. All of this offers a glimpse into the magnificent powers of the universe, and what happens when we choose to go along with it. As I travel further along my manifestation journey, I enjoy learning and sharing what I've learned with others. Nothing delights me more than having another person confirm what I've learned, and things still happen on a daily basis that amaze me. Just two months ago a book title suddenly flashed in my mind. Now I don't even know whether it was a real book title, but I received the book title along with a very clear inner nudging to read the book. I did a search of the title on Amazon.com, and found, to my half-surprise, that the book existed. I ordered and read the book, and it solved a long-standing issue which I had in my life. If I had come across the book in a bookstore, I would have passed it up because the title did not seem relevant to the issue I was facing. It did not occur to me that the book would be the solution to my problems, since the title suggested something different. And yet the universe knew better. We have to conclude that there is always a greater force guiding us, and leading us towards our greater good. Intuition plays a great part, and intuitive people often have a clear feeling or innate understanding about what to do next. While taking action is important, what is even more important is to know what action to take at the right time. Intuitive individuals, those who are in tune with their feelings, are often great manifestors because they can translate their inner perceptions and feelings accurately into outer directed action. They also trust their own feelings and do not second guess themselves. I used to believe that intuition was something we are born with, and that nothing could be done to change how intuitive we are. As I was fine tuning my own manifestation process, I noticed a link between intuition and effective manifestation. I was even more surprised and delighted to discover that one's intuition could be improved through the use of binaural beats and brainwaves technology. I had tried binaural beats and brainwaves technology about a decade ago with a famous company in the industry. Each CD would contain a certain carrier frequency, that would be progressively lowered as you purchased and listened to the next level. The idea was that you gradually entrained your brain to certain frequencies, that were associated with particular spiritual experiences. I gave up the practice after a while as the system was expensive, it cost thousands of dollars for the full program, and it took too much time commitment, about an hour or more a day, if I remember correctly. Recently I heard about another company that had taken similar technology and shortened it into a 20-minute listening session, 
with the specific purpose of increasing one's self-awareness and intuition. The basic idea made sense and resonated with me, so I went for the program. The idea is that certain individuals are intuitive because their brains operate and light up in a particular manner. Therefore, by listening to the specially produced audio tracks, which contain the gentle sound of waves or rain with specific carrier frequencies embedded behind them, our brains can be made to light up in the same manner and therefore the same intuitive states could be induced. I tried it for only about a month before I received that book title Suddenly One Day, something which has never occurred to me in the past decade of spiritual practice. While I cannot say for certain if the experience happened as a result of me listening to the CD, I have a deep inner knowing that it certainly helped, in some way. If you are interested, the program is called the Infinity Program by the Imrama Institute, and more information is available at www.bandmanifestationsecrets.com slash intuition, note, this is not a product by me, although I wish I had invented it. I am putting my reputation on the line and making an unsolicited recommendation here because I personally paid for it, use it daily, still do, and love it. I believe this product, when used in conjunction with the manifestation techniques outlined in this book, has the potential to create amazing results in your life. If this feels right for you at this point in your life, I encourage you to try it too with an open mind. Let's sum up what we have been talking about in this chapter, there is physical action involved in the manifestation process. But it won't feel like a chore, or drudgery. It will feel natural and easy for you, and you will feel led to do it. If at any time physical action feels forceful or artificial for you, or if it feels that you're making a sacrifice to get something done stop. Because you're trying too hard. When it looks like nothing is happen, remember, that is when everything is happening. That's why physical action is sacred. You take it only when necessary only when guided to do so. You take it only when you feel a very clear and positive impulse to act, and until then, you do nothing, and work on your inner self. If you understand how action fits into the whole equation, you would have mastered the creative process. And it is so. Summary of Manifestation Principles Why are these principles called secrets? They are secrets not because they are deliberately banned, forbidden, or hidden from public view. No one is keeping you from learning or applying these secrets in your own life. They are secrets because most of us, through societal conditioning and a belief in lack, have conditioned ourselves to ignore them, even though they have been in plain view all along. They are so obvious that they have become obscured. They are so simple that we have taken them for granted all along, instead choosing to suffer and create things the hard way through sheer physical action. Remember, once you learn what these secrets are, you'll always have a knowing smile when thinking about your manifestations, whether manifest or not yet manifest, because you just know oh what sweet secrets the universe knows. There are no fixed steps or sequence for manifestation. What works is what works for you. Feel free to play around until you stumble upon what works and creates results for you. Looking to copy the recipe of another usually leads to no results. It all starts with making a clear intention. You do not have to state your intention in words. Your intention can be in thoughts, pictures, actions, or even feelings. The universe picks up and acts on your every intention, good or bad, moral or immoral. It does not judge or discriminates. It acts on every intention equally. If your intention is pure, it will manifest very fast for you. By pure we mean untainted with negative, counter-intentions or worries. If your intention is impure, or if you worry about how something will come to you or question your ability to have it, you are adding all of that into the manifestation mixed bag. 
the universe will then deliver to you that mixed bag, which is often nothing at all since your intentions cancel out. If your intention is pure and you are at peace with yourself, then your manifestations will come really, really fast. If your intention is pure and you see no difference between what is in the physical realm, and what is in the spiritual realm, then your manifestations will also happen really, really fast. Our reasoning, rational mind always tries to intervene by questioning whether something is possible. It does so through doubts and worries. We need to silence the conscious mind for effective manifestations. If silencing the conscious mind is impossible for you to do, then you need to engage the conscious mind like a small child. Give it a task to work on or something to wrap itself around while the universe carries out your manifestation. If this means making up a game to play, such as the use of manifestation cards, do it. We do not know what is the highest and best for us from our physical perspectives. Sometimes, certain things that we wish for so badly do not come true for us because they are not the highest and best for us. We can keep ourselves open to possibilities by adding the words, I intend this or something better, for the highest good of all involved, so that the universe can deliver something even better to us. Something that we can't even conjure in our wildest dreams. Trust me, the universe knows just how. It is not your job to figure out how or when something will come to you. That is the universe's job. It is your job to decide clearly what you want, and then let it go. It is also your job to act on impulses and nudges when they come. Of course, even if you choose not to act or them or to second-guess them, they'll keep coming to you, in different ways until finally your attention is captured. You can make no mistakes in the creation or manifestation process, because everything you have created knowingly or unknowingly, you can undo at any time. You have complete free will, within the agreements and boundaries of our space-time reality. You can never ask for something that will harm you, because you can never be harmed. All is always well. You are already an expert and adept at all of this. Whether you consciously realize it or not, you are constantly molding and shaping energy, moving it through form, into form, and out of form. You are to have as much fun as possible and not to give two hoots about what other people think of you, and what you want to create because they too, are free to create within their own worlds. And IT is so. Tools and resources to help with your manifestation. Manifestation Cards, http www.manifestationcards.com Infinity Program from IMMRAMA Institute, http://bandmanifestationsecrets.com slash intuition Other books by Richard Dots, also available for Amazon Kindle. Band Mind Control Secrets The Magic Path of Intuition with Florence Scovel Shin.